Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on what's another muggy, intensely shitty southern Florida morning uh, in late June. And I know I talk about the weather too much. It is cathartic for me to get it out. So, uh, look, I did too much last video. I'm not going to do much now. Rest assured, it's awful. It's just absolutely awful. And uh, the humidity is going to be the death of me. Uh, the good news is, after this Meekum auction, and this is one of the cars I have going to it, so I thought I'd do a video on it, even though I've done some Cadillacs like it before, and I'll link to those below. Uh, after that, I've reserved a cabin up in the mountains for like a week and I'm going alone. I'm going up there with nothing but rifles and, and novels and I'm just going to detox for an entire week and contemplate, you know, the homicidal thoughts going through my head all the time and try to get rid of those. And I think it's going to be good. The weather up there looks pretty nice right now. And if it holds, it should have some healing powers for me. Uh, so that's, that's coming up. Uh, but that's a while away. So look, we're going to do a short take on First of all, in Cadillac and the Eldorado, and then get into this particular Eldo, you know, all at once. Uh, Eldorados were made from 52 to 2002 across 12 generations. Uh, this is the 10th. Uh, probably one of my favorites, but that's mostly because it's a car of my youth. You know, it's something I remembered. I had a Buick version of this we'll get into, but uh, it's just a car that was important to me growing up. Uh, it was obviously huge hugely popular in movies and TV. One of the most famous ones being that casino movie where, you know, supposedly it had a steel plate welded which saved, uh, you know, De Niro from getting blown up, which was absolute fiction. But anyway, uh, it's a very, very popular car. And it was one of the first um, downsized GM. It's the first downsized Eldorado, anyway. And one of GM's most successful, in my opinion, at least if you take it in terms of sales figures and uh, what's considered to be popular opinion. Uh, it came out at a time when Cadillac was under intense and increasing pressure from European car companies, you know, the upstarts like Mercedes and BMW and Audi and whatnot, uh, American luxury car buyers were increasingly moving towards those marks and away from Cadillac, which had really overplayed its hand uh, with its incredible success, you know, in the decades prior. You know, they really did suck up a lot of wins back then and paid for it, you know, from the 80s onward. And frankly, they still haven't really recovered. Uh, it's one of the oldest American car companies, and they've always been known for their luxury cars. It was formed by a guy named Henry Leland, kind of a cool cat, but apparently much more of an engineer than he was a, uh, a businessman. And he built it from the remnants of uh, Henry Ford's first car company, which had fallen apart over arguments with investors. They called in Leland to liquidate and basically said, look, no, use my engine and let's keep this thing going. And keep it going they did, and it became a pretty good company right off the bat, building some pretty neat stuff, and uh, it, it worked well. Interestingly, Leland would go on to form the company Lincoln, Cadillac's eternal number one competitor, uh, yeah, a little less than a decade later after he had sold out to GM, uh, I want to say in like 1909, uh, William Durant's GM bought uh, Cadillac and uh, then Leland took that money and, you know, fooled around for a while and then he built Lincoln. And then, ironically, Lincoln went into receivership. They started hitting trouble. Henry Ford came in and lowballed him and bought Lincoln out and then drove Leland out of the company as revenge for what uh, Leland had done with Cadillac earlier. So a lot of really nasty shit going on back then. In fact, poor Leland died penniless and miserable in Detroit. He was like a tour guide for some auto museum and, uh, you know, living in basic squalor. And my God, does my heart go out to that guy. I'm sure I'm going to end up the same damn way. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's just a sad thing. Uh, they, but they became hugely successful Cadillac right off the bat and globally famous. 
and were for years. And they built some of the finest cars ever made, you know, some of the most notable cars. And, uh, you know, they pioneered all sorts of stuff. And it worked out really well for Cadillac. They really had earned that standard of the world moniker that uh, they used as a tagline. Uh, and the El Dorado nameplate, it comes from, well, you get into El Dorados, it, it comes from a Spanish word. Uh, well, two words, meaning either the golden one or it refers to the lost city of gold, the Colombian legend that was followed by conquistadors and whatnot. Uh, and uh, that's where that came from. And it was named after an internal competition. Uh, there was a woman named Mary Ann Marini who was obviously clever, and she entered it with that name. And uh, she won. I don't know what she won. Um, the last car, what the hell was it? The um, the Thunderbird. It was a dude suit that was on the line. So hopefully Mary Ann didn't win a dude suit. But you know who knows what Cadillac offered women in the in the 50s. But her name appeared on this uh, concept car in 1952, which was just amazing, amazing car. And that carried over then to a production convertible that was made in 53, uh, another incredible car, and Cadillac's then most expensive car, uh, which basically became kind of a familiar nesting spot for the Eldorado over the years. The limousines, I think, were a little bit more uh, the factory limousine, but otherwise the Eldorado was always the most expensive or close to the most expensive Cadillacs made. Uh, it brings us to this. Oh, I, I, fucking, I'm telling you, it's just one of those mornings. I'm a little bit into the coronavirus whiskey. It's lovely to have a shot of that first thing, uh, but it does sort of make me stumble over my bulleted points and get a little bit confused. Anyway, they brought out the uh, Eldorado Seville nameplate and the Eldorado Biarritz nameplate. Uh, you know, Biarritz being that resort town in southern France and Seville being the city in Spain, uh, to distinguish between the hardtop and convertible models of the Eldorado. Dorado. And that went on for a few years, and then the names disappeared, came back as a Seville car later. And then in 76, the name Biarritz reemerged as an up level. Uh, trim package on Eldorados, which brings us basically to this car, this 1983 Cadillac Eldorado Biarritz. So that's where the, uh, the names all came from. And, uh, you know, <laughs> It's basically, there were three cars. There was the E-bodies from GM. It was the Riviera, the Toronado from Oldsmobile, obviously the Riviera from Buick, and then this Cadillac. And they, they were the three uses of this front-wheel drive E-body platform. By far, the Eldorado is the most striking. I don't think it's the most beautiful. I give that nod to the Riviera, which I owned and maybe I'm partial to, and I think they're the most attractive. But there is no question that impact-wise, impactfulness, uh, the Eldorado is really the, the one that, that sort of won the day. Um, you look at the design of this thing, the, you know, the knife edge fenders on the front and the rear, uh, big chrome bumpers, little bumper rats, quad headlamps and scotched in chrome. Uh, you've got chrome slathered over the whole car, particularly on this Biarritz model, which adds this chrome strip uh, down the top of the fenders, big stainless rocker panel, a uh, nice little impact strip there, chrome around the front windshield, stainless roof, which harkens to that 57 Eldorado, which was one of the most expensive cars of its time and made the Rolls Royce of the same year kind of look like a Yugo. I mean, it was just an amazing piece, that 57, 58, and uh, this stainless roof. And you know, you can make fun of the stainless roof, but it's cool as shit. And yeah, <laughs> I admit it, man. I think it looks really cool. And uh, you know, the windows, it's not a true hard top because those back windows don't go down. Uh, Cadillac did sort of make convertibles or they had them made and they did go down in that case, but in these coupe versions, they didn't. Uh, you've got this incredible sharp roof line with a big slanting front windshield, a flat top going into this intensely formal, you know, drop off rear window with a little vinyl quarter top. Very, very attractive. Uh, you've got wire wheel covers, although in deference to the Europeans, you could get alloys at the time. And in 83, in fact, there was a touring coupe, uh, which I did a video of, and you can see that in the link. Going back into the rear fenders, you've got these sort of elegant uh, emblemed 
knife edge tail lights on the knife edge rear quarter panels. Uh, lovely little dip from the top down into the uh, into the side belt trim there. I mean, just an absolutely striking car. Love the wire wheel covers. Love it all. And you know, I they just don't make anything else like this. And they never will again, but we'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to pause for a second, get my thoughts together, and then we're going to continue. So bear with me. All right, so let's just get into this one. And again, this is all so historical and classic. I love it. So you swipe up this Cadillac uh, coat of arms here on the emblem. It clicks into place. So you don't have to fight that while you put the key in. Also has a release inside, of course. You can pop it. You hear that trunk suck down thing coming up that's so gm to me uh behind here is the uh, gas door which is a nice place to have it secreted and hidden uh there you see the trunk is quite large uh you know the entry point is kind of high you got to get your luggage up and over that but once you do it's big enough and uh riding on one of these temporary spares if you have to uh it does at least at a minimum keep the trunk space big so uh you know sean's infant or any other infants or toddlers would be pretty happy back here because of that sort of thick carpeting it's got it's well insulated it'll be kind of a nice quiet cushy ride for them and uh hopefully everyone would be fine but it works out well and i think that also was necessary as part of the downsizing to have a useful trunk because if you remember the prior eldorado was the size of a battleship uh so there would have been no trouble fitting anything in the back this one which was you know like a ton or half a ton lighter and much shorter and uh, you know, it still had to have pretty good cabin room and pretty good trunk size to make the traditional Cadillac buyer happy. Suck that down, you just click it in place, and there it is, it pulls the, uh, the trunk down. Have a look under the hood. All right, so from 79 onward, there were a bunch of different options. Well, not a bunch. There were a few different options you could get in this thing, uh, engine-wise. Oh, God. Uh, we'll get into this engine in a second, but initially you could get a six liter Cadillac engine, which had that ridiculous cylinder deactivation of the 864. Uh, you know, again, this was malaise era, so they were trying to save on gas. Um, it did not work well. Uh, obviously, the computer control at the time, you know, they were basically using a, you know, TI scientific calculator to do, <laughs> to do the figuring. And to, but you could cut one wire and it just became a six liter V8. And I think that's what most people did. Uh, in California, there was a 350 Olds that they came with, which was probably a great motor for it. And uh, that was... Um, that was more of a California thing. And then you could get a six cylinder for the first time in a Cadillac in a long time. Uh, and that was um, a Buick based, actually had more displacement than this, but we'll get into again in a second. That was a 4.1 liter V6. Uh, there was a diesel, which was a converted gas motor you could get, uh, which was pretty terrible, although you can upgrade them now with head bolts and some other stuff and make them serviceable and they're not that bad anymore. Uh, but uh, they weren't beloved at the time and even though there was a diesel craze going on uh, which Mercedes hugely capitalized on it Cadillac and GM had a hard time uh, and then there was this which is the HT 4100 or high technology 4.1 liter uh, V8 uh, which is a much maligned engine for good reason and bad I mean it's actually not that bad if you follow the maintenance schedule uh, the engines are fine it has the weird setup of having an aluminum block with iron head which is kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. And that meshing of different materials didn't work well to the point that Cadillac actually gave customers these little stop leak pellets, you know, the kind of shit you get in these little roadside <laughs> part stores to keep going. Cadillac actually had a GM part number that they gave people to put those in the radiators to sort of keep them from turning the oil and water into a milkshake. And uh, if you keep doing that, they do fine and actually have a fairly nice smooth torque curve. Uh, horsepower is ridiculous. I want to say it's about 160 or something in this. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a V8 and does have some torque and as a result is a very smooth engine. Transmission
suspension wise they started with three speeds a, a front wheel drive version of the uh, th350 and then went into a four speed uh, with overdrive uh, 700 which is a great trans in this thing uh, really really wonderful it was also the first Cadillac to have both four wheel disc brakes and a fully independent suspension uh, you know maybe a nod to the Europeans maybe just because it was easy to do uh, but it worked out really well and still is a full body on frame design uh, which gives you the smoothest ride on the highway so you get that big you know Lincoln town car ride on the highway with this thing because of the body on frame construction and I think the whole thing just came together great and I think that's a big reason why they sold well and why the downsizing of these cars really didn't hurt them all that much love the big cornering lights on the side uh, anyway so there it is there's the mechanicals I'm gonna pause again for a minute we're gonna hop inside get my shit in the trunk then we'll go for a spin bear with me one moment all right, so let's have a look inside this thing and go for a spin. Love the big long door. Uh, you've got frameless glass, which is a nice American hardtop type touch. If those back windows went down, you'd have a true hardtop. Uh, inside, I can't decide if it's like a place where old British gentlemen get together to drink whiskey and talk of empire or some kind of high class Spanish bordello. But either way, that would combine two of my favorite activities. And I just absolutely love it. I mean, it is so distinctly American and so distinctly luxury, uh, particularly in this Beeritz format, that um, it just absolutely melts my heart. I miss. I miss cars like this. It, I mean, you look at a modern luxury car, and it's distinguished by things other than accessories and chrome bits. And I mean, it's just, you know, all computer screens and mood lighting. And, you know, this is a very, very different world. And it harkens to an America of the past when America was optimistic and cheerful. And, you know, when you had arrived, you drove a Cadillac like this one. Anyway, you can see the button tufted seats, the pillow seating, uh, absolutely gorgeous and uh, unique to this um, Beeritz trim package. Uh, back in the back, your Canadians are going to be beyond chipper. You can fit three if you want, but two with great comfort. And they're just going to melt into those seats. You got map lights, you got, you know, a little tiny package shelf there. Uh, you got a uh, armrest that folds down and just expanses of this incredible burgundy maroonish leather, which is uh, just gorgeous to look at. Map pockets in the back. You got little oh shit handles for them with wooden chrome trim. You got stainless chromey Cadillac encrusted trim down the side of the seats. I mean, when you're letting someone in the back seat of this thing, you know, be it a, you know, hooker or your golf buddies, they're going to be impressed and they're going to think you've made it. You've also got twin ashtrays, uh, which, uh, you know, is probably a little bit of a holdover, even in 83, but it's fantastic. Uh, so this car actually has four ashtrays total, uh, which should be enough to accommodate even the heaviest smokers. Um, you got six-way power seats, actually eight, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. yeah, eight-way power seats on both sides. That was an option. Uh, the fact that it has it on the passenger side tells me this wasn't a rental. You could actually have a manual seat in this. Uh, you could also have a memory seat if you went up a notch. So there were lots of sort of high-end early options in these cars that, um, you know, distinguish them from other GM products. Love the little pull handle. Love the acres and acres. Acres. I mean, if this were real wood, you'd have killed an entire rainforest just to get the inside of this car. Thank God it's simulated. Uh, but it's nicely simulated, and they did a good job. You know, you've got deep pile carpeting on the bottom of the door panels, this leathery stuff, you know, which isn't uh, on the door panel. The deep, you can lose a dog in the carpeting on this thing. A small dog would just sink into it. Uh, you can see it still has the original mats with the Cadillac crests, all very nice. Top end. Uh, you've got a leather wrapped steering wheel that tilts and telescopes. Uh, very, very nice stuff. Here's your cruise control switch, Captain Chrome. Uh, your dashboard panel. Very minimal information, just kind of what you know your average Cadillac driver needs, which is your 85 mile an hour speedometer, your PRNDL, uh, your cruise uh, turn on, your two information centers, which will pop up if your engine seizes, uh, your wiper control and wash and 
your headlights with Twilight Sentinel, uh, which is, um, you know, turns your lights on and off. Also had auto dimming, which is kind of cool. And uh, there's your cruise control switch. Uh, over here, you've got your trip computer or fuel economy data. Nice stuff. Very small electronic climate control unit. And uh, an in-dash symphony sound AM FM cassette stereo. Can't get it to work, actually, which is annoying, but it's original, and I wouldn't want to change it. Uh, up top, you've got, of course, uh, cocaine mirrors left and right. That would have been expected. Still working, although that cover's a little loose. Uh, you've got a place to stick a garage door opener in here, and of course your map light. So, anyway, let's fire this thing up. Also, dual mirror controls, which are manual, by the way. They're not power mirrors. At least I don't think so. Let me check. Oh, yeah, I take it back. That is a power mirror. Cunningly designed to look manual. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nice stuff. Give ourselves some AC because it's kind of miserable this morning. But anyway, these 55,000 miles on this thing. It's a terrific car. Uh, absolutely lovely way to drive to feel like you did back in the day. Uh, the overhang dash is kind of fascinating on this. Uh, reminds me of like a Camaro or a Corvette, which of course does fit GM design style at the time. And uh, what the use of it is, I don't really know. I suppose it shields all the instruments from glare and whatnot. Uh, you get into here, you got a big glove box, although it's not that deep. There's a trunk release. Uh, this is kind of cool. Here's all the original manuals that came with the car. You know, you're, you get all this for you know, spending a lot of money at a Cadillac dealership, some service records, and uh, the original purchase documents, which are neat. So there you go. You see it was sold at Harry's Cadillac Pontiac out of Asheville, North Carolina, somewhere I'm going to be close to soon, thank God. And uh, this uh, Mr. Galloway fella bought it for $22,858, which came to a total cash price. Look at the sales tax, $120. That's fascinating. $22 for license, and I don't see the $9,000 dealer fee, so interesting. Uh, way to buy a car 23 out the door looks like must have been his offer and uh, down here there was no trade-in so that's what he got and it was owned in 18 by another guy named Galloway so this thing was definitely one family owned for a long time and uh, just neat to get all that shit with the car so uh, this one's new enough in 83 to have the four speed so uh, let's go for a drive and there you see that beautiful vista out of this those knife edged fenders coming up on the sides the beautifully creased angles going towards that center uh, hood ornament with the wreaths and crests uh, I didn't do a night drive but you see there it's got the um, uh, light indicators. That's a fiber optic system that lets you know your headlights and taillights and all that shit are working. And uh, it's just, what an amazing, what an amazing piece. I mean, it's one of the last years that you're going to get a true American Cadillac. I mean, Cadillac makes some neat stuff now, but they're not really for people who like traditional Cadillacs. I mean, you pull up somewhere in this thing and the impact of it is shocking. I mean, you pull up today in a luxury car and it looks a little bit like a stretched and heightened Altima. You know, it just doesn't, it, there, there will not never come a time again when car manufacturers use this formula for luxury, being, you know, ostentatious with touches that are unnecessary but lovely. And this car was just designed to confirm an impact on the guy who pulled up in it. You know, he's arrived, he's made it, he's got this beautiful Cadillac, he's got this puffy blonde in the right seat with all the right curves. And, you know, it's just one of those things that really, really worked out well, in my opinion. And I think that's why they make such cool collectibles today. Because the next generation Eldorado, they were really downsized. They were much more European. And try as dealers might to sort of pimp them up, you couldn't conceal what was underneath. And that was, it was just a very, very different car from the Cadillacs of ages past. I think even being the first downsized Eldorado, I think this thing really retains everything that made Cadillac special. Um, and I'm just trying not to kill the suicidal squirrel. Lunatic. 
and I just love it. And obviously that 4100 is not going to set any speed records of any kind. I mean, it is just not a potent V8, but it is a V8 and it does give you some torque and it does give you a nice smooth ride. And if you look after it, it'll also treat you well. that thing just aim in the way, glinting. You know, this thing at night under the street lights, it glints off of every bit of chrome and shiny paint on the car, and it's just stunning to look at. Absolutely stunning. You know, it's a pinky ride if you want, over-assisted power steering. You do have the four-wheel discs, which give you good braking. Uh, you know, the ride, again, fully independent on a body on frame, very smooth, and a lovely car to cruise down the boulevard. So, anyway, I'm a sucker for these E-bodies. I really am. Give me a Riviera, but, you know, this will do just fine. Uh, thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to keep trying to get some fun stuff going. I've got a couple more at the works. And uh, either way, we will see you with the next one. If you have an interest in this thing, again, it's going to be in that Meekum Kissimmee next week. Uh, going through, I think, on Thursday, July 6th. i got to get it up there. And uh, I tell you what, if you end up with this one, you'd be pretty happy with it. It's a really, really, only 55 on the clock. And uh, just a lovely, well-preserved one-family car. Thanks for having a look. Really appreciate it. We will see you with the next one. Take care.